So when I worked in Italy, uh, one thing I noticed uh, was the way they celebrate weddings. If you've ever been to an Italian wedding, it's very, very different to an Irish wedding. Uh, the Mass is more or less around about the same time, usually in the morning, um, 11, 12 or 1 o'clock or something. And they are not afraid to dream big. When it comes to Italian weddings, they are not afraid to dream big. When I worked on in Naples, like, it was just the done thing that the hotel was going to cost in or around 100, 120 euro a head per guest, right? Because basically you have 16 courses. Uh, I kid you not. I was... Ro I, I was swollen, I think might be the <laughs> word. I don't know. Because um, food just keeps coming, just keeps coming, just keeps coming. And of course, us being Irish, like, we have no idea how to deal with food, no idea how to pace ourselves. Because we always think, you know, everything has to be on one plate. This is the only meal you're going to get. This is how we eat here. So you always heap the plate, right? But no, 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 no. No, because there are going to be three plates of pasta, right? And then will come your vegetables, which is harsh. And then there's going to be uh, a plate of fish, and then some other dinky little fish. Uh, and then will come your kind of, you know, your, your potatoes or whatever like that, just on its own, like it's a separate plate, right? And then will come a little slice of meat. And then will come uh, the first round of desserts, and then the second round of desserts, and then the cake, the actual wedding cake. And then some creme brulee or some, what's it called again, that snobby yogurt? Sorbet, sorbet, to refresh one's palate. And all of these things, but just, just, just the food just keeps coming, right? And then... And there's a small little bit in a dancing, right? And then everyone goes home at about 10 o'clock, ready for work the following day, right? Completely different experience. But like, I mean, I've been to medics, and like I said, the food just keeps, and then like, like these, what are they called? Crabs and lobsters and just expensive food as well, right? There was this one where they had a full tuna. I'd never actually seen a full tuna. I, I, don't even, I thought tuna was about that size. <laughs> and came in a, some kind of a tubular form. Uh, but no, it's like they're about as big as a dolphin. Uh, with basically on a spit, a full-size tuna, and they had like uh, those n like net curtains blowing in the wind all around it. It was like you know one of those meatloaf videos. None of you would know what a meatloaf video is, but the music videos from the 90s of you know. Okay, very. They're not afraid to dream big. Not afraid to dream big. And I was just thinking, like, when I was thinking of Italian weddings, the importance of dreaming big. Uh, Maura, Gar Maura Murphy here, uh, who one of, the, one of the founders here of Holy Family, one of the expressions she would always use at the beginning is dream big. I'm a kind of a practical nature, practically natured person, so I, I dream as far as I'm capable of achieving, if you know what I mean. I find it hard to dream big because then it means uh, there's a, there'll be a whole area here that I won't know how to do because if I can't do it, I tend to, I, that's where I'll stop my dream. You know, I have to be able to kind of do whatever uh, I, I, I aspire to accomplish. Whereas she would say, no, no, don't, don't limit what God can do in you by what you can do. Right? Don't limit what God can do in you by what you can do. You know, so dream big. <clears throat> now, the idea of dreaming big, I think, is really, really important in the church as a whole. Because if we don't dream big, we begin to actually accept the way things are and say, oh, there you go, that's kind of the way it is. And then as the standard is dropping little by little, we don't even notice that it could be different. It actually could be better. Because <laughs> the standard is dropping, yeah, sure, the standard is dropping for everyone. So, so we stop dreaming big. We stop dreaming of how the church could be. Now, I'm, I'm saying this in the context of, of, of a lockdown because some people are saying, well, do you know, when this lockdown ends now, what will happen? And some might say, well, sure, hopefully, you know, we'll get back to the way things were. And it just struck me. Hopefully it won't go back to the way things were. I really don't want things to go back to the way things were last March. You know, think of the last couple of years where we've had the, the lowest number of entrants uh, into the seminary uh, in its history, where youth attendance at Mass was dismal, where young couples and young families attending Mass, the numbers of them were dismal, where so many couples were getting married without really understanding what they were actually doing sacramentally. Or so many kids were getting baptized into families that weren't practicing. So it's just, it's like things were not ideal. So to go back to that, no, I'm not in a rush, not in a rush to go back to that at all. Pull, on, pull the brakes on, 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 on that for a second and just say, hang on, allow yourself to dream big in the church. What do you want? What do you want to see in the church? Well, I guess I want to see 
a seminary, not necessarily bursting at the gills, but with a good number of good men who love the Lord and who love the church and who love her teachings. And if they don't love the Lord, love the church, love the teachings, don't enter a seminary. Don't. Uh, I want to see a, a church full of families that love the Lord, or at least are, are, are searching for the Lord and want to actually discover who he is and have this <clears throat> hunger for a deeper relationship with the Lord. Uh, I want to see a, a church that's welcoming. You know, so like it actually feels like a family, feels like a home. You know, a church where when you go in, actually everyone is singing. So the fact that I can't sing at all makes no difference. Blast it out, man, because everyone is singing. You know, so a church that when the Lord says, when the, when the priest says, the Lord be with you, there's a thunderous response of and with your spirit, you know? And everyone is sitting in a way and compose themselves in a way and is attending mass in a way that I can see they actually believe they're about to receive Jesus. And so I can actually confidently invite a friend of mine who is a complete atheist to come to my local parish church, nothing special, just an average Sunday mass, and he's going to see a community that gazes at the Blessed Sacrament, that gazes at the, at the sanctuary and that awaits with abated breath the moment they can receive Holy Communion. See, the difference it makes when we, when we dream big in the church is actually, wow, we've, we've accepted a really low bar for, for a long time. It doesn't have to be that way. It shouldn't be that way. The, the, the standard that, that we should have and should be aspiring to and should work towards in the church is a standard of, of, of profound faith. You know, when we hear our, our, our reading today, the prophet Daniel, the people were in, were in exile at the moment, okay? So they're, they're not in the promised land. They have been exiled to Babylon. And they were exiled to Babylon because they turned their backs on God. They fell into idolatry again, put, putting something else in God's place, anything else in God's place, idolatry, whether it's my body or my success or my power or another actual God or even political correctness can become a God. Now, we must do what's politically correct regardless of what the church teaches, regardless of what the scripture says. We must be politically correct. Um, whatever, putting anything in, in, in the place of God is idolatry. So they fell into this again and they were exiled. Right? You don't want God's blessing, you don't have to have God's blessing. You don't have God's blessing, things are going to go wrong. Okay? So here they are in exile. And, and this is the, the attitude they have, which is a good attitude to have, right? O Lord God, great and to be feared, you keep the covenant and have kindness for those who love you and who keep your commandments. We have sinned, we have done wrong. We have acted wickedly. We have betrayed your commandments and your ordinances, and we have turned away from them. This was written, Jeannie, I should know this, uh, centuries before Jesus, all right? Uh, and it's entirely relevant to today. Entirely relevant. Five, cent five centuries, yeah, I think, in around the, the, the first example was the 503. Yeah, so it's about five centuries before Jesus. So 2,500 years ago. Uh, and those words are entirely relevant to us today. Imagine like if we as a society, as, as, as the Irish nation were to say, you know, Lord, we, we've allowed abortion. And if it's going to, if, if, if it'll be, if, if it'll go to a vote or an election, chances, a referendum, chances are, we will allow a new euthanasia as well, because there's no one to push back. Okay, so, but imagine like if we were to actually kneel down as a nation, as a people, and say, Lord, you've, you've given us commandments, and we didn't follow them. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our ancestors. We have not listened to scripture when it spoke to us in our hearts, when it came to deciding our, our government. Okay? Integrity, Lord, is yours. Ours, the look of shame we wear today. We, the people of Judah, the citizens of Jerusalem, the Catholic Church, near and far away in every country to which you have dispersed us because of the treason we have committed against you. To the Lord our God, mercy and pardon belong because we have betrayed him. We have not listened to the voice of the Lord our God nor followed the laws, the laws that he has given us through his servants, the prophets. And so they, they, they repent. They, this, this is the season of Lent. It's a season of, of repentance, of conversion, turning around again, facing the Lord, 
nor I've been living in a way, in a way that's just completely career-oriented or completely me-oriented. It's all about me and satisfying my needs and making me the centre of my world and fulfilling my desires and my passions. And even though the world tells me this is what will make me happy, I've done so, it didn't make me happy, but I continue to do so anyway because I didn't see an alternative. But there is an alternative, and that is, Lord, that you be my God and I be one of your people. That you, that I recognize you, God, as my father and recognize myself as your son, as your daughter, and therefore as royalty. That's so why I've got to behave as royalty. Can we come before the Lord? Girls have this thing. I'm no expert, so they may correct me even during the homily. Uh, but there's a thing called concealer, and apparently on concealer, which it basically is kind of a brown goo, um, it says it will hide your blemishes. Right? So you buy this stuff, and you squirt it on yourself, and it hides all of your blemishes. Okay, Concealer. We do not need concealer in the presence of the Lord. Okay, Because it doesn't work. You can't hide any of your blemishes before the Lord. Before the Lord, you don't need concealer. Before the Lord, you just lay it all open. You just lay your heart open because he sees the way it is anyway. So this conversion, like it, it's not an exterior thing. It's an interior thing where we turn our lives back around to God. And if enough individuals turn their lives back around to God, then families turn, their, turn back around to God. Then society begins to turn back around to God. Then a whole nation can turn back to God. It begins with me begins with me, today, now. Let us not be afraid to dream big. And let us not be afraid to turn back to God and to say, look, Lord, the way, even the way things were before COVID, it's not actually what I want to go back to. I want to go back to a, a vibrant, life-giving church where you are solidly at the center where we unashamedly say, Lord Jesus, you are my God. You are my everything. You are all I need. You are the fulfillment of my every desire. Where Jesus is the center of family life. Where Jesus is the center of our politics, of our schools, hospitals. We're a long way from that. But that's, I'm not saying this now to criticize or condemn anyone. Um, it's actually our gospel today as well. Uh, do not judge and you will not be judged yourself. I'm not saying it to judge. But I'm saying this, like, just look at the way it was. Look at the stats. Look at the way the faith was lived. We, we are not where the, where the Lord wants us. Good, so how do we get there? In order to do so, we'll have to dream big. And in order to do so, we'll have to go beyond our limitations. So do not allow what needs to be done in the church to be limited by what you can do. The Lord is the Savior, not you, not me. And so we place everything in his hands that the Lord may in this time of, of change make the necessary radical changes in our church to bring us back to him to bring us back to reverence and a sense of awe in the liturgy and adoration and our lady then standing so, so proudly at our side as we, as we pray as, as her children with such love for her son May the church be renewed and may Jesus be at the heart of it. Amen.